At this time, we enter into our scripture reading, which is going to be in two parts. The story of Joseph takes a several chapters in the book of Genesis towards the end of the book of Genesis. And you will be seeing a video uh, that kind of shares and flushes out the story, much like last week's video that had rave reviews. And I want to share something similar, and then I will pick up and read the remaining part of the 50th chapter of Genesis. Enjoy. Joseph. So part of God's story is found a guy named Joseph, as we get like this. Once there was a guy named Joseph who had ten older brothers and one younger one. When Joseph was a boy, he was his dad's favorite. In fact, his dad liked him so much better than his brothers that he gave Joe a special gift to prove it. You can imagine this made his brothers jealous. And Joe only did things worse. He told his brothers about dreams he had to do ruling over him. Well, this made Joe's brothers furious. One day they were working and saw Joe coming. They said, here comes that dreamer. They threw Joe into a dark pit. They might have left him there forever, but they met some men traveling from Egypt and sold Joe to them as a servant in the city. They thought that was slightly nice so than leaving him in the pit. Then they went home and told their father Joe had been killed by a wild animal. This broke their dad's heart. Kids, these brothers were really bad news. Some say that it's never a good idea. Ever. But the Bible says the Lord was with Joe. When Joe was a servant, he worked for a really important rich guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar liked Joe so much, he put him in charge of the whole house. Joe was happy until one day he was blamed for something he didn't do. Potiphar sent him straight to Joe. Well, God was still with Joe, even in prison. But God decided that he liked Joe so much, he put him in charge of all the other prisoners. Then God gave Joe special knowledge about dreams. When two prisoners had dreams, Joe knew what they meant. So he told them. Two years later, Egypt's ruler called Pharaoh had a dream, and nobody knew what he meant. But by now, one of the two prisoners Joe had helped was out of jail and working for Pharaoh. He told Pharaoh about Joe, and God helped Joe figure out what Pharaoh's dream meant. But Pharaoh's dream was really more of a nightmare. It meant that everybody in Egypt would have food for seven years and be hungry for seven years. Joe told Pharaoh the only way to survive was to store food during the seven good years. Well, Pharaoh thought Joe was acting brilliant. He put him in charge. During the seven hungry years, nobody could eat without getting food from Joe. He was like a human vending machine. Well, remember how Joe had 11 brothers? Like everybody else, they had to get food from Joe. And when they came, they didn't even recognize their brother. But Joe knew who they were. He secretly tested them to see if they changed. After all, they did throw him in a pit and sell him. Finally, he couldn't hide who he was from his brothers anymore. He told everyone to leave him and he was about to cry. After stopping for a few minutes, he told him, I'm your brother Joseph. I'm the one who sold him. The brothers couldn't believe him. They had hurt Joe. But God had taken care of him during the good times and the bad. Even with everything they had done to Joe, he forgave him because he was willing to follow God, even when it was hard. Joe told him, You planned the harm, but God planned it for good. And God used Joe to save many lives, including the family that was part of God's special rescue plan. And that's the story of Joseph. The story continues in the 50th chapter, verses 14 through 22. After burying his father, Joseph went back to Egypt. All his brothers who had come with him to bury his father returned with him. After the funeral, Joseph's brothers talked among themselves. What if Joseph is carrying a grudge and decides to pay us back for all the wrong we did him? So they sent Joseph a message. Before his death, your father gave us this command. Tell Joseph... Forgive your brother's sin, all that wrongdoing. They did treat you badly. Will you do it? Will you forgive the sins of the servants of your father's God? When Joseph received their message, he wept. Then the brothers went in person to him, threw themselves on the ground before him, and said, We will be your slaves. Joseph replied, 
Don't be afraid. Do I act for God? Don't you see you plan evil against me, but God used those plans for my good as you see all around you right now, life for many people. Easy now. You have nothing to fear. I'll take care of you and your children. He reassures them, speaking with them heart to heart. The story that you saw and heard is the essence of forgiveness. Joseph's forgiveness of his brothers, I believe, serves as a useful template as to how we should forgive and why we should forgive. And it begins here. It begins with the understanding that we forgive so that we might be obedient to God. In a Christian culture that interprets the will of God differently many times in many ways, the act of forgiveness is very clear and succinct. Forgiveness is an act of obedience. Let me repeat that. Forgiveness is an act of obedience. Let's travel to the New Testament. The 18th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. The story of a man who owed a king a large sum of money. And the king forgives that man. Soon after, the man that was forgiven by the king has a friend who owes him just a small amount of money. He has him put in prison. And in this passage, Jesus teaches us that God will treat us like we treat others. Another illustration in Scripture in the New Testament is when Jesus teaches that when you come to worship and you have something against someone else, you have a grudge, you leave that time of worship, you get right with them, and then come back with a heart that is ready and worthy to worship God. We must forgive first. Because if we have an unforgiving heart, then God cannot forgive us. We need to cultivate a heart to accept God's forgiveness, and we do that when we forgive others. Now, I don't know if it's urban legend or just this nice story, but I'm going to share it with you anyways and pretend it's true. It's the story of Leonardo da Vinci. The great artists. The story goes something like this. He had a knock-down, drag-out fight with a friend of his. And after the fight, after the disagreement, he made his way back to his studio, sat on his stool in the effort to continue painting a portrait. He had his brush in his hand, and he was so worked up, he was so angry, he couldn't make a single brush stroke. He knew what he had to do. He put the paintbrush down, he made his way back to his friend, and made a mess. After that, he went back to the studio, sat on his stool, picked up that paintbrush, and finished the portrait. Oh, and by the way, it was a portrait of Jesus himself. We forgive as an act of obedience to God, but we also forgive so that we might be compassionate with one another. Let's face it, forgiveness cuts at the very core of what it means to be human. Forgiveness is hard. It's difficult and darn near impossible sometimes. But what often gets lost in the Joseph story, and I hope you saw it in the video or heard it in my reading, is that Joseph wept when his brothers asked for forgiveness. His heart offered them pity and compassion, not anger and bitterness. Now, 
Don't miss this either. Yes, Joseph wept. He, he shared compassion. But don't miss his honesty either. Joseph let him have it. He told them all the things they did wrong. You threw me in a pit and you sold me and you did A, B, C. And he was very honest with them. But it was honesty that was veiled in compassion. And this is where I think our culture seems to be struggling. We're struggling as we confuse justice and mercy. They are not the same. In Scripture, justice proclaims to the prodigal son, you are no longer worthy. You messed up, dude. But mercy kills the fatted calf to celebrate that he has returned. In Scripture, justice allows the Pharisees to stone the woman caught in adultery. But the words of mercy from Jesus himself says, Those who have not sinned, let them cast the first stone. In a culture that is so absorbed with finding faults, with judging amidst our hypocrisies, we remember Jesus saying on that mount, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We forgive so that we might be obedient. We forgive so that we might be compassionate. But lastly, we forgive because we can't wait to see what God does with it. In spite of Joseph's hard labor, in spite of the horrors of prison and the loss of his basic human liberty, Joseph never lost sight of how God could bring goodness out of evil. This story in the latter part of Genesis of Joseph is the perfect example of the overruling providence of God. Where God can take our messes, our mistakes, our stupidity, our brokenness. Where God can take all of those things, our arrogance and self-centeredness and sin, and use them for good. That's the good news this morning. Even our faults, our brokenness, can be used for God's glory. That's the message of the cross. That's what the cross is all about. From a human point of view, the death of Jesus brought shame, disgrace, and suffering. But death on the cross through the eyes of God is used to set us free from sin and bondage. God looks at the cross and proclaims, you meant that for evil. I have made it good. Exclamation. I end this. As I was working through this reflection that I wanted to share with you this morning, I was haunted by a question I couldn't let go of. I could understand the idea that we forgive to be obedient, we forgive to be compassionate so God can take our mess and make it good. But I'd like to share the question I was haunted with and will be haunted with in the week to come. So I want to make it your question too. I had to ask myself, am I strong enough to forgive? I mean, am I really, truly strong enough to forgive? Am I strong enough to be obedient to God and forgive? Am I even compassionate enough? Is my compassion strong enough to forgive? Am I strong enough to trust God's overruling prophets? Amen. No. No, I am not. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we forgive. Only when we are connected to that power, that force, 
that love. Can we forgive one another? We cannot offer what we have not received. Am I strong enough? I am with Christ who strengthens me. I'm often moved about the story of the Turkish soldier who was beating a Christian. And he beat him almost to death. And as that soldier was pummeling that man, and the man was bloody, and he would just stand and kick him. He hovered over that believer and pointed down to him and proclaimed, So what can your God do now? And the beaten man with the voice that he had left, it's very commonly said, God can give me the strength to forgive you. Are we strong enough? Can we be strong enough? Indeed we can. So that we might forgive as an act of obedience offer compassion and be able to take a step back and see where God takes us. Let us pray. Wonderful God, we thank you. We thank you because you are the foundation of it all and your faithfulness never wavers. When we are weak, when we are broken, when we don't think we can carry on, when we don't think we can forgive, we turn to your faithfulness that is never ending and always enduring. Alone we can do very little. But with you and the power of your spirit within us, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens. We pray all of this in your glorious name this day and forevermore.